Welcome to the Two Pages Project, part of the Coil Entertainment Network. I'm Rob Steele. If you'd like to become a published author with us, stay tuned after the show for a vast majority of the details. But first, let's get to this week's story, where we return to the mysterious world of Cooper Wright, whose current case leads him through City Hall, politics, and a mysterious person in a fedora in a story called The Suit by Rob Steele. It worries me a bit that I don't mind this kind of thing anymore. Not the death itself. It still bothers me that people kill people. What kind of person would I be if that didn't bother me? Uh, Okay, a politician, I suppose. But it's seeing the bodies that doesn't bother me. At least not as much as it used to. This one is pretty straightforward. Maid finds a body in a hotel room. One bullet wound to the forehead bullet is likely in the wall behind him, where his gray matter is doing a Jackson Pollock imitation. It's not really gray, though, is it? I mean, there's some grayish to it, but it's almost a pastel pink with a lot of gray in it. See, that's it not bothering me as much as it used to. I'm thinking about making sure the color is described more accurately and not worrying so much about the poor man whose internal coloring I'm worrying about. Here's his wallet, Coop. Dr. Song Ho Young is doing his cursory field examination of the body and hands me his wallet. Driver's license says a victor's name is Roger Sims. Six foot two, 175 pounds. Lives a couple miles from here. I look back at the body. 175. Looks like he's put on weight since his last renewal. 210, easy. But those kinds of things happen. It's to be expected. Although I'm sure he wasn't expecting the reception he got. My guess, since he lives nearby, he was probably meeting someone here discreetly. Probably an affair. No pictures in his wallet. Probably has some on his phone, though. No one seems to carry photos anymore. Of course, no one seems to use film anymore, either. No film, no hard copies of the pictures. It's rather sad. Hey, Doc, you find his phone? Dr. Young pats down Mr. Sims' suit and looks puzzled. He doesn't have one. Who doesn't have a phone these days? He looks up at me and pulls his own phone out of the inner pocket of his coroner's office windbreaker and shows that even he has one. Your killer probably took it with him. Doc resumes his examination and discovers a button and a piece of thread in Mr. Sims' inner jacket pocket. Mr. Sims' suit is a dark charcoal color. This button is silver, and the thread is beige. It doesn't match. I turn to Mark Davis, the CSI on this case, and tell him to see if he can track down what kind of suit the button and thread come from. After all, it could belong to our killer. I leave Mark and Doc Young to finish up the scene and make my way to the security office. I've been in the Marlin Hotel a few times over the years. On cases, of course. So, security is familiar with me. They usher me into the control room, where I'm bombarded with a concophony of images being shown on at least 20 monitors. Well, this is new. New ownership of the hotel says Peter Green, the new head of security. They decided that having better security would mean we could charge more, or something like that. Make people feel safe and they'll pay a premium. Anyway, we figured you want to see the footage of the guy when he checked in. Here's what we got. He motioned to the big monitor in the middle. I have no idea how you'd keep track of everything on all the monitors all the time. The main one was, thankfully... Nice and big, and clearly showed Mr. Sims checking in with someone in a beige suit wearing a fedora. We tried looking for other angles that showed Hatboy's face, but we can't find one. Mr. Green apologized while handing me a DVD case. Here's a copy of the footage. Maybe your people can find something that ours can't. And before you ask, we checked with the staff. They don't remember the guy. I thanked him for his time and make my way back to the station to do some research into Mr. Sims. Didn't find much, though. No outstanding warrants, 
clean record, one speeding ticket about 10 years ago near, <laughs> of course, August Acres. I know that place, though. It really is a speed trap. Nothing suspicious on his credit cards. Basically, what I've got here is Mr. Roger Sims, banker, single, lives in a small apartment near his work. The only real odd thing is a complete lack of social media presence. So no posts anywhere about who he was seeing socially or who he was meeting at the hotel. That pretty much means it's up to the CSI lab guys and Dr. Young. That is when my cell phone makes the most bizarre noise. I look at it and there are several numbers on the screen and a couple of names. Thankfully, Detective Manny Vasquez is not only in the office, but more tech-savvy than I am. He takes the phone and presses a couple buttons that I can't see before laying the phone on the desk and telling me, You had two calls come in at once. I just conference him for you. Okay, Doc, you're up first. Oh, thank you, Manny. Nothing of real importance here. It was the gunshot to the head that killed him. Small caliber, probably a twenty-two. No other signs of foul play. The time of death puts his murder at about eight o'clock last night. Hopefully you'll have better luck with the button and that thread. That we have better luck with, said Mark Davis over the phone. We've not got much on the button, but the thread is a special weave of metallic rayon and silk called milk that we've tracked down to a specialty shop on Cody Avenue called, and I didn't name it, Taylor Swift. They'll make you a new high-quality suit in about a day. Well, according to the slogan, anyway. I thank them both and get the address of the Taylor. I know there's a joke in there somewhere about Taylor Swift, but I'm not getting it. As I enter the shop, I notice the mannequins all have nice suits, and there's an actual hard copy catalog on the counter. The shop isn't that large, but it doesn't need to be. I suspect people come in, choose a suit, get measured, and everything else takes place in the back. I'm greeted by a wayfish man with a name tag that reads, Daniel, manager. Oh, honey, that suit is not going to do it for you. You should have come to me sooner. He rushes around the counter and grabs one of my arms and lifts it out to my side and begins measuring. After a brief struggle, I eventually have my arm back and finally get out an introduction. Daniel, I'm Lieutenant Cooper Wright with Homicide. I'm investigating the death of a man who was killed by someone wearing one of your suits. Thankfully, that got him to stop measuring long enough to look appalled. I can't believe someone I made a suit for would kill. I've never had that happen before. Oh, but, but this is a little exciting in one of those awful but exhilarating ways. What can I do to help? I've always wanted to do a Jessica Fletcher kind of thing. <sighs> Look, Daniel, I just need a list of people you've made a suit for out of... Uh, what's it called here? I take out my notebook and flip a couple pages until I find the word milk. Daniel seems fascinated by the... Real police notebook, oh my god. But eventually calms himself enough to say, Oh god, milk? Really? Wouldn't have guessed that one. I've only made one suit out of that stuff. It's awful. So many people are allergic to it. Of course, I find that out after I've ordered three bolts of the stuff. The man you're looking for is a city councilman, you know. Alexander Horn. Oh, and he, he seems so nice, too. I know the name. Never met the guy, but he's popular around town. Just dedicated a park downtown and has worked a lot with children's programs. He's been really good for the town, and now I have to bring him in and interrogate him about a murder. I run it by the chief and clear it with everyone before I put in the request for someone of his stature to be summoned to headquarters. I decide to play politics and usher the councilman and his attorney into the conference room. Gentlemen, I have an issue. There was a man murdered last night named Roger Sims. Evidence collected puts you in close proximity to... What evidence? Balked his lawyer. I hate it when lawyers interrupt. We found a button in some thread that matches a suit made for your client at Taylor Swift. She never gave him a suit. The lawyer spat. 
She never gave him? Oh, wait. Taylor Swift. Now I get it. That's that's horrible. The singer was in town a couple months ago, and Councilman Horn did make a big deal about it. Thankfully, he also realized how annoying his lawyer was being. It's my tailor shop, Steve, he said, putting a restraining hand on his lawyer's arm before turning to me. But I haven't worn the suit yet. There is an upcoming event. Perhaps you've heard of it. The Beige Brothers Birthday Bash? It's a big to-do in my circles. What, with the Beige Brothers being one of the largest construction firms around? I had planned on wearing it then. Besides, I don't know anyone named Mr. Sims, was it? Gee, no trace of smugness there. Just like there's no sarcasm here. Can you account for your whereabouts last night around 8? Our suspect was wearing your suit and a fedora. Councilman Horn seems to sit back a little bit. His lawyer puffed himself up a little before answering, He was with the mayor and several city councilmen and a television crew. The press conference last night? The one where we praised the work of this city's police force? Surely you watched it. I heard it was happening. I think I even got an invitation to it. I also try to avoid situations like that, much in the same way I try to avoid the plague or being run over by a bus. As I attempt to come up with a retort, the pair rise and begin to leave. Before you go, gentlemen, we'd like to take a look at the suit. I hand the lawyer a warrant. He examines it and shrugs. It's all yours, Lieutenant. It's in my bedroom closet on the right side. Now, if you'll excuse us, we have another function to attend. By the way, I don't own a fedora. I send Detective Vasquez and CSI Davis to retrieve the suit. I also ask him to look for the fedora. It's covered by the warrant. While they're gone, I contact one of the local television stations and acquire the footage. I skim through it, and just about every shot has the councilman in it. Television and the mayor as an alibi. That looks pretty good for him, but horrible for me. Manny returns to the office with a couple of sandwiches and hands me one. Good old Manny. It's not until that first bite that I realize that I'm not sure I've eaten all day. Manny tells me they found the suit right where the councilman said it would be. They found the fedora, too, but in the whole closet. It wasn't really hidden, but it wasn't terribly obvious, either. Both were in the lab now being tested. I suppose that's something. About an hour later, I get an excited phone call from CSI Davis. We found something interesting, Coop. Actually, two things. One, there is gunshot residue on the suit. Someone fired a gun wearing it recently. Awesome. We might have to arrest a councilman tonight. That should be fun. I do so love dealing with the media. Much like dealing with... Well, before I can come up with a quip in my head, Davis continues. But here's the kicker. The hat had some hair in it. Preliminary DNA shows female hair. I think it's time to go back to the tape. That was a woman in the hat? Of course, all we have to go on here is this video. It might not even be related to the councilman. Maybe somebody else could have gotten a suit like that in another town. I return to the hotel footage and examine it myself. Not that I don't trust the lab guys, and it's not like I kicked them out of the lab either. We're all there watching and mumbling to ourselves. That's a woman? Built like a guy. Who wears a fedora these days? Wait. Check out the fingernails. The video is rewound to where we get a distant but distinct shot of longer fingernails that are colored. At this distance, it's hard to tell exactly what color. But it is enough for us to conclude that is a woman. Now the $64,000 question... Who is she? Better yet, how did she get the suit? I asked the lab guys to make a hard copy print of our suspect and head back to the office. It takes Manny less than five minutes to track down where Councilman Horn is. A benefit for the homeless. Of course. After an initial declination to enter the establishment, the head of security, Phineas Jones of all people, not only lets me in, but escorts me to Councilman Horn, who, expectedly, 
looks displeased. Lieutenant, I thought we'd been over this. We have, sir, but I need you to look at this picture. I hold up the picture with the image from our video. That's your suit. We tested it, and there is gunshot residue on it. We found the hat at your house, too. But the hair in the hat belongs to a woman who isn't in our database. We were hoping you'd know who she is. He took the picture and, after donning the reading glasses from his suit jacket pocket, examined it. It didn't take long before there was a resigned sigh. Carla. Carla Stanton. She works for me as a maid. She's a hefty woman, but I didn't realize we wore the same size. Not sure why she's wearing my suit. Does that help you out, Lieutenant? I thank the councilman and Phineas and call Manny, who after a moment comes up with Carla Stanton's address, which is on the other side of town. Manny says he's already dispatched two squad cars to pick her up. It wasn't long before we had Miss Stanton in interrogation room one. Councilman Horn was right. She was not a terribly feminine woman. She was certainly as tall as the councilman, and she also did seem to have his girth. Frankly, there was nothing feminine about this woman, right down to the rather butch haircut. She wasn't wearing the councilman's suit, of course. She was in something a little more feminine, but not much. She was found with a Ruger LCP, the one with a little laser sight on the trigger. Not a big gun, but certainly a possible match for the murder weapon. Ballistics were testing it now. Miss Stanton, I'll come straight out and say it. You are our most likely suspect in the murder of Roger Sims. I place the printout of the video on the table between us. What I'm not understanding is, why are you wearing Councilman Horn's suit? And why did you shoot Mr. Sims? Actually, why were you even carrying the gun? She stared at the picture for a good long moment. I looked good in that suit. Alexander hadn't even put on that suit yet, but I knew it would fit me. We were the same size, you know. As for Roger... She trailed off and looked into the distance. I met Roger a while ago in one of Alex's functions. I thought we hit it off. We exchanged numbers and emails and kept in touch. After a while, the conversations did turn romantic. He'd mentioned having a fetish for milk, and I knew that Alex had a suit made of the stuff. Actually, I recommended it. I knew the councilman wouldn't be paying attention if I borrowed his suit. He never does. I like wearing men's suits. They fit me better. So I wore the suit when I met with Roger. It was going so well. We'd meet for drinks. He flirted. I flirted back. We got a little... touchy-feely. And I decided to get a room so we could be more... well. But when we got to the room, it was a disaster. Oh, we kissed, which was great. But then he touched my breast, and then... I don't know. She began to sob. He said there'd been a mistake. He thought I was a man. I know I'm not very feminine. I know I wear men's clothes, but I am a woman. She pounded the table with her fists, and it shook profoundly. She sniffed and regained her composure. I had the gun with me for protection. You never know how these things are going to turn out, right? She stared off into the distance again before continuing. He said he'd never been with a woman, and he didn't want to start now. And certainly not with a woman who looked like me. He wanted a man. I was furious. And that's when I shot him. Is that sufficient enough for you, Lieutenant Wright? Oh, that's sufficient. Thank you. I rose and exited the room. I was greeted by the district attorney who had been listening in the other room. He says the ballistics came in, and it matches. We have an ironclad case... And we have our man. I winced at that. I'm not sure I'd phrase it that way, sir. She already killed one man for saying that. The further adventures of Cooper Wright will be in forthcoming episodes, once I've written them. Although I would rather make podcasts out of stories you wrote. That is the purpose of the show, after all. If you'd like to become a published author with us, that's what we're here for. I know it's hard to get published. 
unless you've been published, which makes no sense. So what we do is we'll take your short story, publish it first as an ebook on the website, then we'll turn it into an audiobook for the podcast, and when we've got enough stories, we'll turn it into an actual book that you can buy at a store. Yes, you could get money out of this. See, there's an incentive. If you'd like to submit a story, email it to contact at twopagesproject.com. We will be open to any type of story you want to send us, not just mysteries, but sci-fi or fantasy, historical fiction, western melodrama, whatever you want to write. Just submit your story for the audiobook treatment and publishing on our website. Don't forget to use the new email address, contact at twopagesproject.com. And don't forget to pass the show around to your friends because it's free and it's fun. Now, there are a few rules on the website. They're very simple. Check that out, twopagesproject.com. You know what? Pass that around, too. We would like to thank iTunes, the Google Play Store, and the Happy Hour Network for passing the show along. And don't forget to follow all the Coil Entertainment Network shows on Pinterest and YouTube as well. And if you're interested in being part of the audiobook process, use that same email address, contact at twopagesproject.com. So, until next week... Be safe and keep writing.